Okay, let me now start the economy panel. I'm E.P. Fujiwara, professor of macroeconomics at the ANU here and the Keio University in Tokyo. So, uh, weather is fantastic and uh, it's a little bit unfortunate we don't have any windows. So I wish we <laughs> could do an economy panel outside. And uh, cherry blossom is blowing. Is it cherry blossom? Yeah, so that I hope some of you can enjoy Hanami twice this year. Okay, so that, okay, let me start the economy panel. So we are really fortunate to have two distinguished speakers in this panel. Professor Mariko Sakakibara, UCLA Anderson School of Management, and Dr. Takashi Kozu, uh, Vice President of Rico Company and the President of Rico Institute of Sustainability and the Business. Let me introduce the first speaker. So Professor Mariko Sakakibara is one of the most respected academic economists from Japan. Um, she received a BA and MA in architecture engineering from Kyoto University and the University of Tokyo, respectively, and then joined the Ministry of International Trade and the Industry. She studied at Herbert as a Fulbright Scholar and received a PhD in business economics from Herbert. Uh, she, since then, Mariko has been at the UCLA Anderson School. Her main research interests are alliances, innovation, and the technological change, intellectual property rights, uh, multinational corporate strategy, and national competitiveness. And uh, Mariko has published her research in leading scholarly journals, including American Economic Review, Run Journal, Run, Run Journal of Economics, Journal of Economic Perspective, Journal of Industrial Economics, Review of Economics and the Statistics, so that I think we can continue forever and uh, we can run out of time just introducing her publication. So let me stop, stop, uh, uh, let me stop here. And uh, notably, she's uh, also a co-author with Michael Porter and Hirotaka Takeuchi of the book, Can Japan Compete? So, uh, which was selected as one of the books of the year in 2000 by The Economist magazine, and uh, which has a lot to say, Japan, as of now. Okay, then uh, uh, the, let me, let me uh, introduce the second speaker. The second speaker, Dr. Takashi Kozu, is known as expert on the Japanese macroeconomic issue. Uh, Takashi has deep knowledge of various economic issues, such as the financial system, monetary and fiscal policy, and aging, namely almost all important issues in macroeconomics in Japan. Before joining RICO in 2010, he worked for the Bank of Japan from 1980, where he was advisor to the governor for parliamentary affairs and the public relations, and also for international affairs as to banking regulations. And uh, he was a member of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision from 2006 to 2010. Actually, when I was young, I, 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 was, I had the privilege to work under his directorship at the Bank of Japan. So he is the best of, best of us I have ever had in my life. <laughs> also, I admit I tend to say this whenever I introduce my former boss anytime. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, having said that, uh, honestly, uh, uh, I think I'm, it was, uh, it was really for fortunate to be able to work under the boss who encourages challenges and pursuing something innovative. As you know, work, uh, to be able to work in a such circumstances is a rare, rare opportunity. So I, I was really lucky. And uh, uh, Takashi recently published a book, at the moment only available in Japanese, Misunderstandings in Deflationary Economy. I hope you, you have, have a book, but you don't have a book. Yeah. And, um, I'm not quite sure whether my translation is right, but um, he has uh, written a really fantastic book about the uh, uh, comprehensive view about the macroeconomy in Japan for the last three decades. I really hope that, that this could be published in English in the future. So without further, further ado, we would like to start the economics panel. And uh, please join me welcoming the first speaker, Professor Mariko Sakakibara. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm Mariko Sakakibara. I'm, a UCL. I'm teaching at the business school, so it is, you know, I have to move around <laughs> when I speak. So, um, so coming from the warm, sunny California, uh, it's a little bit chilly here in Canberra, but nonetheless, I'm really enjoying my stay here. So I'm going to talk about the Japan's labor market. So I'm going to start from some macro view, um, some showing some macro statistics and what's going on behind the Japanese um, labor market. And I want to focus on some issues about the microstructure 
of the um, Japan's labor market. And I'm so, specifically focusing on the friction and choice and conclude with some recommendations. Um, for this audience, this would be very familiar um, figure. So the, this is a Japanese population structure. Each bar is a population and for each age. And back in 1950, it looks like a pyramid structure. It's a typical to the, any developing, developing country. A bunch of um, babies are born and they die over time, and so, <laughs> unfortunately, you know. So the, and uh, so the, this blue part is a well, working age population. So they, they're only supporting a very tiny portion of the population. Then this is 2020, so currently, and uh, including a one-year forecast. So the, at the bottom of the pyramid, we, we, uh, you, saw, you saw in the previous slide, it's now coming in the orange age, right? And so this is the bottom of the pyramid. And the working population, that blue part, still big, but now uh, on top, the aged um, people. Forecast to, uh, to uh, 2040. So now it looks like a mushroom cloud, right? It's something, something exploded, I guess. The, the population bomb exploded. So the, um, the, this is the working age population. Now you know, it's shrinking and the babies are even you know, shrinking even further. And on top, there are a huge age, aging population here. So the um, this is a, a, a proportion of elderly population by country. So the comparison uh, among major countries from 1950s to this is including a forecast up to the 2060. So Japan started out kind of young population uh, country, most rapidly aging. And this um, vertical line is right now. So Japan is already 30, about 30% of the population is uh, over 50, 65 years old, and the most aging population, and if you look, and it continues to be so. And if you look at the top three aging population, uh, population country, Japan, Germany, Italy, I guess there's something common in, during the World War II, but I'm not getting into that, okay? Uh, so, okay, so the unemployment rate. This is the, over the last 10 years or so, uh, again, picked up by some major countries. Japan is a red line. So the unemployment rate is low and getting even lower and lower. That's consistent with the previous picture that the working age population is shrinking. Uh, I put Australia here, so it's the blue line, kind of stable, I think. And the uh, uh, United States, this is a, uh, uh, the black line, kind of unemployment rate is declining. Okay, so the um, it clearly, so, we, uh, we can expect, and actually true, that uh, uh, there's the excess demand. This is a graph plotting the job opening to job applicant ratio. So that for every, uh, each job applicant, there are 1.5 job openings. So this is a seller's market, and increasingly so in the more later years. So this dip is like a great depression time. So what we can see from this is that clearly there is excess demand. Demand is greater than supply in the labor market. The labor market is one of the markets, just like a um, you know, product market or financial market, it is a market. So if the demand is greater than supply, that economics 101, right? So what's gonna happen? What should happen? So the price has to go up, so that in the labor market, wage would increase, or the people can switch jobs for better opportunities, or the supply side would um, increase because you know, people can see the opportunity and perhaps inflow of foreign workers. Let's see, let's see what happens. So the wages, this is a wage co growth comparison between US and the Euro area and Japan. There are three bars. So the blue bar is from the 1995 to 2007. Green bar is 2008 to 2017. Red bar is the most recent, including one projection. And the overall message is very clear. 
Uh, Japan's birds are lower. That means wage growth is much, much uh, slower than US or the Euro area. And Japan, for the first two birds, are under the lost decades or lost two decades, whatever. And so the wage is not increasing at all. But even recent um, wage growth, that is pretty much still lagged behind all other major economies. So I showed that uh, there is the excess demand of labor that the previous blue line we saw, and but uh, labor turnover rates that is defined as the number of job people who joined the company or the left the companies um, divided by the number of employees. Surprisingly, even though the workers' demand is increasing. Um, labor turnover ratio is pretty stable. People are not moving around to seek better opportunities. Um, percentage of foreign labor force, that is um, it's uh, Kamikawa's you know, keynote speech. So this Japan, looking at from the, um, over the last uh, 10 years or so, the percentage of foreign labor force is a little bit above one percent, which is not really, a little bit, tiny bit increase, but not too much. And it's way lower than any other major countries whose data I can uh, take. And um, you know, like UK is 10%, USA 15%, and even Korea is, you know, South Korea here, uh, it's 2%, so the higher than Japan. So what's going on? So I want to point out, there are of course many reasons, but I want to focus on two issues. The first is the friction in the labor market. For any market to function, there has to be free flow of people, free flow of information. But something is, um, there are many obstacles that prevent from the free flow in the Japanese market. The first one I want to talk about is a rigid hiring process. So the, it, it used to be the lifetime employment was a norm, even though lifetime employment was limited to the male workers working for big companies, maybe primarily manufacturing. So that wasn't a big uh, proportion of the, all the workers, but it's even more shrinking. Nowadays, um, young people, when they join the company after the graduation from the college, they don't expect to stay in that company, or they, they are not sure if that company would exist for the next 10 years or so. Okay, and so still, however, the hiring process is pretty rigid. So what happens is that, okay, um, there is an agreement um, by the member companies of k down then that the Federation of Economic Organizations, that is a you know, big company's organization. So they agreed that they're gonna start recruiting new college graduates on March 1st of their third year, that is the end of the uh, college student's third year. So this is what happens on March 1st. So the, all the college students go to the company, line up and to hear the uh, information session. And you can tell that um, you know, everybody almost wearing the same suit, same color, even the same hairstyle. It's so unbelievable. Okay, so the, uh, this very rigid hiring system, so it's typically still in Japanese companies tend to hire a bunch uh, right after the uh, people graduate from college and they train internally, even though that structure is not sustainable. And this rule to start recruiting on March 1st is going to be abandoned, I think, next recruiting year, but then by the Keidan then, but then Japanese government said, Wait, you know, you guys have to keep that rule. I, I have no idea why uh, the administration is saying that. Okay, so, the, and uh, even after people join the companies, uh, the mobility is restricted. And uh, one of the, so the, when people join the company, they can develop their own skills. And there are two types of skills or human capital. Um, one is a firm-specific human capital, that is, you know, if you work for Sony or Toyota, you learn the Sony way, right? 
and then versus you can develop industry-specific human capital. That is a knowledge that can be transferable to if you go move to your current employer's competitor. Okay. And uh, so, you know, if you know people are talented and learn quickly, learn more, you know, variable skills, they should get the opportunity um, out, outside of the, the, the current employer. But what that prevents is a non-compete contract. So what's non-compete contract? So that is a uh, post-employment restraint um, that prohibits workers from going to the uh, current employer's competitor or start their own company, competing company, for a certain uh, amount of time in a certain area, in a certain activity. In the case of the United States, uh, it's typically like two years restriction, maybe typically in the same state and uh, uh, the same thing as you are doing at the parent firm. So why does that exist? Um, why do people sign non-compete contracts when they are hired? Um, so if people can freely move, uh, then the company has less incentive to develop their knowledge, their human capital in the, com in the company. So the knowledge creation would be hindered. So the non-compete non contract is a way to restore the incentives of company to invest into human capital. Um, so other means would be, uh, would be there, but it's costly to implement. Okay, so it's, um, it's prevalent in the United States um, in the uh, enforcement of non-compete varies by state. Uh, for example, in California, uh, there's no enforcement of non-compete. So you can go to any competitor in California. Versus in Florida, um, so the if, even if you are fired, uh, then if you have signed non-compete, you cannot go to the competitor. So very, very strict. A strict enforcement in Florida, and all other states are somewhere in between. Okay. And in Japan, non-compete con contract exist, and there's no official statistics available. But the recent effort to get gather information, some uh, surveys are going on, and the preliminary um, results shows that in Japan, non-compete contracts. Uh, as prevalent as in the United States. I did a little bit of research on the effect of non-compete using the US data. And what we found is that in the state uh, which strictly enforced non-compete contracts, spin-out formation is low. Spin-out means that the, you know, a group of people in a parent firm you know, have some business idea and leave the parent firm and start their own firm. That's a spin-out. And that formation is law in the strictly enforcing states. And in those states, uh, skilled workers tend to stay in the same position. And moreover, their wage uh, is suppressed. So the clearly non-compete uh, works to restrict the mobility, restrict the wage, uh, a lot of negative issues. OK, so in Japan, so even entertainers cannot move, okay? So the, um, so the all entertain, so the entertainer, the left hand, uh, right hand, she is a non, uh, very popular TV star and uh, she wanted to have some independence and her agency said no. And now she cannot even use, uh, she, was, um, she was using her birth name uh, to, to be an actor, and now she, she cannot even use her name because her name belongs to the previous agency, okay? And uh, this is the um, uh, most very popular uh, Japanese boys band, and uh, boys, they're doing the boys band for 25 years, and now they got <laughs> in the 40s. They cannot keep doing the boys band, okay? So they want to be independent. They wanted to leave the, uh, the, uh, the agency. And the agency said, yeah, you can. But uh, eventually the top three people left. And, but the agency has such a power over TV station uh, to staff their, uh, the, the, their entertainers. 
So they cannot even show up on the TV. Okay? So the so the um like even those people have individual talent, they cannot easily really move. Alright. Uh, so the second issue is a limited career choice. Okay, it sounds like working for companies um, is not such a good idea, okay? And <laughs> what about starting your own company? It's very limited in Japan. So comparing the US and Japan, um, so the, in the US, the number of people who are running or working for the companies who is younger than 3.5 years, 14% for the United States versus 4% in the US. The number of startups way, 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 way lower in Japan. How about the uh, um, venture capital investment? So venture investment, $3 billion, um, but if you take the ratio of the venture investment to the total market cap, Japan is the lowest among those uh, countries. Okay, so this is a survey uh, taken from the 54 countries. So the, they asked the uh, college students who are business and management major, and uh, are you gonna be entrepreneurs five years from graduation? And um, the top, very highest countries, in Peru, Panama, et cetera, so the, um, 65 to 67% of the people say, yeah, I want to be an entrepreneur in five years. Um, they're typically uh, you know, emerging economy, uh, so perhaps the existing jobs are not that attractive. I put Australia, uh, I, I found the Australian people are more entrepreneurial than I initially thought. So about half of the people think that they want to start their own company um, in five years. Okay, Japan, among 54 countries, the bottom, right? <laughs> so, the, you know, only 14% of the um, business majors said, I want to be an entrepreneur in five years after graduation. Okay, so the, um, the alternative to be an entrepreneur is a gig economy, freelancers. Gig economy like Uber driver. So the, instead of starting your own company, you can work on your pace whenever you want to work, and even you have some you know day job and start working at, at, uh, after work. And uh, the study shows those people typically have some other job, and Uber people tend to drive like a Friday night or a weekend. However, the work pattern varies by week. And so they work whenever they want to work. Um, if you go to Japan, open up your Uber app, call for Uber car, a taxi shows up, okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding, uh, because Uber is uh, restricted in Japan. The only way Uber can work in Japan is to have an you know, you know, uh, alliance with taxi companies so that taxi people can keep their jobs. Okay. So, okay. Um, so all of them indicate some um, restriction on the labor mobility or flexibility. So I recommend that possibly the Initial hiring, tra internal training model doesn't work anymore. And so the year-round hiring at any level would be recommended. Limit the enforcement of non-compete contract. You have to let people move freely for the better opportunities and allow the development of gig economy like Uber Lyft and on the job training at the college level so that college kids can be exposed more to what kind of opportunities they have to, um, uh, to develop their career. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Abe agrees with me. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to 
in the first place, thank you for Ipei introducing me uh, to much exaggeration, I should say. Um, my name is Takashi Kozu. I'm from, from Tokyo, and uh, I just can't make a kind of a entertaining fashion of my presentation, so I stand still here, uh, as uh, many Japanese do. And um, uh, uh, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm a, a kind of person who is doing more like market economist job. So my, my presentation will be more general and uh, I'm going to pick up a couple of um, issues here today. Um, let's, uh, the current issue, let's look at this um, uh, table. This is the short uh, history of uh, China. Uh, U.S. Uh, trade dispute, and this uh, uh, friction casts a shadow on Japan's economy. Um, it's an it's a, uh, external uh, matter, and uh, if you look at the right-hand side, uh, Japanese yen is appreciating against the dollar because you, you, uh, the trade friction all over the world uh, hits a U.S. dollar and make it weak. Th that means stronger yen, and stronger yen do, uh, does harm on Japanese exporters, and therefore that will cast a shadow on the equity prices in Japan. Um, if you uh, see the level uh, of uh, the equity price index, it's uh, the green one, um, comparatively lower if you compare it with other countries' uh, equity price indexes. And also domestically uh, in Japan, uh, consumption tax hike is scheduled uh, in, in coming October. And this is the uh, uh, est um, ex estimation of growth rate uh, made by major um, economists in Tokyo. And on average, they expect negative growth rates in, in, in the uh, fourth uh, quarter uh, of this year. Um, although the government is planning to expenditure the almost whole amount which they observe through the tax hike, but yet uh, the economists uh, see that the, the, the economy will, will be weakened. Uh, this is the uh, um, domestic um, I factor of uncertainty. And because of these two uncertainties, uh, I think the Japanese equity prices already show the weakness. And also, the manufacturing sector here shows a sign of deceleration uh, already. And looking at Japan's economy in more longer term, I think uh, Japan's economy is quite vulnerable against these types of uh, demand shocks. Uh, the reason for that is this one. Um, generally speaking, on the right-hand side, economies is always changing when you see things in the longer term, 20, uh, 30 years of time. Uh, demand changes, and supply side generally trying to catch up with that change in, on the demand side. But in Japan's case, uh, Externally, uh, Japan has to uh, cope with the changes of its environment because up until 80s, uh, Japan just didn't have to compete with China, for example. And um, you may realize that when you go major cities on the globe and then see the TV sets, uh, 10, 15 years ago, all those t many of all the TV sets are coming from Japanese manufacturers. Now, uh, I, I presume outside Japan, uh, almost none. Almost everything is coming from Korea, for example. So that is the fundamental changes. Uh, well, the competition uh, environment has been changed greatly for Japanese manufacturers. And domestically, uh, as Sakakibira sensei mentioned, it's the uh, demographics in Japan, aging society. And aging society means the components of the demand changing uh, slowly but uh, dramatically. Uh, those who stayed in Japan for a while find that there are many uh, ceremony halls for wedding uh, in many cities. But today they are changing for uh, halls for funeral. Um, that's, that's one of the things that um, um, aging society means. 
And uh, new demands are born in the area of uh, elderly care or uh, medical care. But these uh, fields are restricted. Reg I mean, re regulation are stronger in these uh, areas. And because of that regulation, uh, the price mechanism just doesn't balance the demand and, uh, and supply. Thus, uh, Japan's economy uh, always uh, having problem with changing its supply side structure, always, and uh, that uh, force is quite strong for Japan's economy. And when you look at uh, the um, uh, price uh, changes, this is year to year price changes of many uh, several price indices. Uh, you, you can tell that sometimes Japan's economy gets into deflation, but it comes back to normal uh, slight inflation and then coming back to deflation again. This is uh, what I call repeated mild deflation. And it, it's quite strange that if you read economics textbook that uh, always we assume that price mechanisms smoothly balance demand and supply, but in Japan's case, more than 20 years of time, uh, demand and supply seems not stably balanced. Um, I think it's because of all those shocks from the globalization or uh, demographics um, developments. And that's what I wrote my book uh, last day in Japanese. Um, I, I didn't think I, I have to bring it one because it, it is uh, written in Japanese and for the undergraduate students. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I, I sent one copy to uh, Shiro, so probably if you have interest in, in that book, please uh, ask him to uh, have a look. Um, and on the right hand, left hand side of this chart, um, it's uh, what we call output, output gap, um, the total demand, total supply comparing which is bigger. That's, that's the, the, the notion of this uh, uh, output gap. If the output put gap below the, the zero horizontal line, that means you, you observe um, excess supply or lack of demands. If above the line, then it means excess demand uh, in sufficient supply. All those uh, excess supply uh, period corresponds to the mild deflation. So uh, demand side changing and uh, supply side is trying to catch on, catching up with that change but uh, the supply for the old demands, by the way, the um, driver's license, uh, those who have driver's license in Japan cease to increase. So if, if, if uh, you, you see less number of people who have driver's license, it is no use producing uh, automobiles for Japanese domestic people. And that means, uh, the Japanese uh, car makers have to reduce the cars for the domestic market. So that kind of things uh, keep on happening in Japan. And therefore, uh, excess supply for the domestic market and new um, supply just doesn't come up because all those new markets areas are more, more or less more strictly uh, regulated and therefore, Japan's economy always have uh, excess supply and it takes time to reduce that excess supply for such a long period of time. And therefore, if some demand shock comes in on to Japan's economy, uh, the price tended to be go below uh, the, uh, I mean, go down to the uh, mild deflation. That's, that's uh, the reason why Japan is so uh, vulnerable for such a long time to, a, to any kind of demand shock. Um, so that kind of situation is called, someone called deflation equilibrium. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of mixture of slight deflation and very low growth rate, but yet the real interest rate is positive. But that's, at the same time, if you read economics textbook, you can reach the same uh, real interest rate by higher nominal growth rate and higher interest rate. Uh, 
So Japan somehow get into the deflation equilibrium. This is one of the stories. And this chart shows the results of the internet survey which I have been conducted with my research uh, colleagues uh, to, to the individual investors and their um, in inflation expectations um, surprisingly doesn't change in the longer term on the right hand side, uh, quite stable. But looking at 2018 and 19, it, it jumped to more than is it more than 3%? Probably this is a recent changes of inflation expectations, but I, I'm not quite yet sure. But anyway, s until uh, 2017, the ex uh, expectations of on inflations uh, didn't change at all, and that is one of the reasons why that kind of repeated mild inflation doesn't, didn't disappear. But still, I... I should say that Japan's economy have more difficulties. This is the uh, macro level uh, profitability of Japan's economy. Output, output price, macro output price versus mac macro input price. So as you see, and probably you are not expecting this, but until say uh, 2000, middle of 2000s, uh, 2005, around 2005, this uh, profitability, we call it terms of trade, wasn't so bad even if Japan suffered from many difficulties. But uh, it worsened after that, and then there is no a trend of recovering. So this means Japanese farms in general are having a worsened uh, profitability, and therefore they want to raise prices, but yet, as I said, the global competition is so hard and they just can't um, uh, raise their output prices and that uh, sh is not good for getting out from, uh, from my def repeat repeating my deflation uh, situation. And second thing is um, this one. Uh, it's, it's a bit about uh, close to the issue which was taken by Sakakibara sensei in the uh, previous presentation. Uh, Japan's labor market has been changing. On the left hand side, it is the uh, regular employee which is kind of fixed um, employment as, as, as Sakakibara sensei mentioned. Uh, once you employ a company, you just keep on working until your retiring age. The lower orange line is kind of a flexible labor, part-time or gig uh, workers. But as you see, the uh, regular employee, uh, it's, it's more or less level off after uh, the late 1990s. But the flexible labor, non-regular employee is just uh, keeps its uptrend ever since uh, late 80s. This means uh, the representative uh, employee in Japan's economy, the attributes are changing. I in the 80s, it is more the weight of uh, fixed labor is larger. Now, the uh, weight of uh, flexible labor is more larger. But as you see on the right-hand side, uh, the wage difference is so huge. This is a month's uh, salary. Uh, prefixed months salary without any uh, uh, overtime uh, work uh, fees. It's as you see, it's two third of the uh, the 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 wage of non regular employees is about two thirds of that of regular worker. Um, the reason why is thanks to say Word, Excel, uh, PowerPoint. I think almost everyone can use all, all these programs. Uh, the jobs which uh, Japanese farms pay higher cost in, say, 20 years ago, could be done easily by part-time workers. But you, you, you can easily uh, uh, think that um, you can't ask your uh, employer to raise your uh, wage because you can use Word, or Excel, or uh, PowerPoint. But yet your organization is paying some subscription fees to Microsoft anyway. So Microsoft gets some fees, but you can't get some uh, extra wage. 
because you can use all these uh, new uh, programs. So your um, kind of labor productivity rises, obviously. Uh, the, peop the, the employed person who can use Word, Excel, uh, and the employed person who just can't use them. If you compare these two uh, labor, then obviously I, uh, I, I think it is, uh, uh, you, you can presume that uh, labor uh, productivity is improving. But yet, uh, even if that improved labor productivity, you just can't have higher uh, wages. That's, that's the, the world we are living in. So, um, as the uh, average, attrib uh, the attributes of ab average uh, working person is changing, the uh, wage changes, uh, year to year wage changes, at a given level of um, employment rate is lower than before. The orange line is uh, uh, since uh, during the Abenomics period since uh, current year 2013. The blue lines are, 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 are uh, the whole, whole period of time. Obviously the orange line is above, uh, sorry, down below below the linear trend of all these uh, sets of data. So if you have um, weak wage, then that leads weaker service prices, and then that will uh, lead to, uh, well, as far as the price level is concerned, weaker prices. And, uh, and also, uh, the, we are now entering the age of globotics. This is a word used by Professor, um, is it, I, I wrote it down, I should say, Richard Baldwin of the Institute of Graduate uh, Institution of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Uh, robotics is obviously the combination of globalization and robotics. And now we are living, living in the age of uh, digital transformation. Uh, uh, as you know, you, you, you have heard of a, a petty clerk uh, kind of a trend. Um, if, if the average income level goes higher, the uh, s demand for services increases. If you have enough foods, you know, clothes, housing, then you seek more uh, services in, in many kinds. So the, on the left-hand side, uh, it's, it's more general, almost the service sector employee in Japan's economy, it's, it's increasing. So, and we are living in the age of um, digital transformation. So digital services are more uh, demanded by the consumers. But you, now you could rely on the programmers abroad, outside Japan, to make programs. I mean, this on the right hand side, this is the international monetary funds midterm projection of the global growth. And if you see the uh, 1980s, that growth was mainly brought by the advanced economies, the blue part. But now and, and after, uh, the global economy is uh, majorly, well, largely supported by the advanced. Um, economies, and that means higher education, higher training in uh, uh, emerging economies, and therefore they are more and more good programmers abroad. That means uh, white collar uh, workers like uh, program programmers, uh, they have to compete here now with the white collar workers abroad, and with the help of artificial intelligence. Uh, it is more like that the uh, level of uh, the quality of the, the programmers are coming to uh, kind of a level off. Even if you're in the States, in Australia, or in somewhere else, uh, you, you, if you, you can use English, but even if you don't uh, speak right English, then it is okay. A AI will translate smoothly your, 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 your intention into the common language. And therefore, hereafter, I think, uh, the white color uh, people, they have to compete with the emerging um, uh, countries, uh, white color people. So that, that, that is one thing Globotics means. Robotics, you can find many robots all around you now. 
and even in the uh, white color jobs, what you call uh, robotics process, um, um, is it RPA? We call it in Japanese. Automation, yeah, probably, yeah. And the designed repeated simple jobs are all re uh, replaced by the uh, computer programs. And therefore, uh, you have to, the white color workers have to compete with AIs, compete with robots, compete with all those white color uh, workers abroad. That's, that's the, uh, 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 the, the age of robotics and therefore uh, competition becomes harsh and then the wage in the service sector, uh, we, you just can't expect the wage in the uh, service sector just doesn't go up as in the past. So that's, and finally, I would like to mention this thing. In order to overcome such difficulties, you often heard that the key issue is to improve uh, productivity. But if, well, this is what I did, uh, sorry. This is what I did uh, in, in the, the previous picture. Uh, you, well, just skip the details. Uh, you, you just see the, uh, the bottom blue uh, line. Real wage can be uh, decomposed into labor product and labor share. And uh, if you calculate uh, the Japanese statistics with this um, equation down below, then you could tell that uh, in Japan's economy, labor productivity per employee per hour is increasing actually. But it does not, the labor share is keep on decreasing and therefore the real wage doesn't come up. And if you see, see that uh, 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 lowering real wage, that means you can't expect the transmission where higher real wage uh, leads to strong uh, consumption demand and then push up the growth. Then uh, lower labor share means firms gets more. So uh, you could expect that firm expand more investments and then that leads to higher growth. But then again, uh, uh, there are stories about uh, uh, the GAFA firms, uh, Google, uh, Apple, is it? Facebook, and also, what, it, what is it? Amazon, yes, and, and, and Microsoft. These uh, are kind of a platform digital firms. Their activities just uh, do not lead to a higher level of activities on the whole macroeconomy. If you compared the effects with the um, large manufacturers like uh, GE or GM, they don't produce more employees. Their salaries will just uh, go to a very special talented person. And therefore, uh, even if those uh, platform firms get more profits, then that won't lead to higher uh, expenditure of that uh, uh, platform firms. Uh, David Ota, professor of MIT, and his colleagues are, make, uh, uh, are publishing uh, the related uh, research uh, papers on, on this issue. And if this is true, then lower um, labor share and higher um, firms' earnings, but that won't lead to higher investment. If you look at the uh, large uh, equity buybacks by all those firms currently, they won't, they won't link to with the real investment of all those firms, but the fruits will go back to their equity owners who are already rich and they want to use extra money they get from higher equity prices. So these two things, lower real wage and lower effects of the uh, global <coughs> platform firms uh, on macroeconomy, these two things combined uh, measure um, advanced economies are now experiencing what they call secular stagnation. So that one story, uh, sh that should be examined, um, but uh, Japan is not an exception. Uh, exception. And uh, th that's all I would like to say today, uh, but 
finally, I have picked up some uh, uh, maneuver for monetary policy and the fiscal policy. This is uh, interest rates, quite low for Japan, and there's no room for maneuver to uh, make um, demand st stimuli through uh, further monetary years. And for uh, fiscal policy, this is a very long-term simulation of a debt outstanding of Japan's uh, government against the nominal GDP. This ratio should be uh, converged to some level. If you don't believe in uh, there's free lunch, lunches, if the government, even for the government, I, I don't think there is, uh, well, I, I support the, the, the claim that there is no free lunch. Free lunch. But in order to, uh, well, the Japanese government is just showing its prediction until, say, 2025. But if you extend that simulation up until 2045, then that ratio, debt outstanding against nominal a GDP, we're going up again and to diverse in the future. And somehow, if, if the economy is, uh, the government debt is on that course, someday no one uh, will buy any more Japanese government debts. So that's what um, I, uh, we are worrying about. And finally, just mention, uh, if there is any exit from the current um, unconventional monetary policy, the relationship between the inflation and the long-term rates will go back to the normal. And if that happens ever, I doubt it. Uh, while I, uh, before my, uh, you know, well, I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> if, if that happens, then even if 1% inflation, the long-term rates will go up to 2%. If uh, you see the stable 2% inflation, that the long-term rates rate may go, go up to 3%, which the long-term rates currently in Japan is negative now. The negative rates go up to 2%. It's a huge shock on Japan's economy as well. So the Bank of Japan uh, should consider to make the, the process very smooth. But you can't expect the financial market to uh, make their adjustment smooth or slow. Financial markets tend to quick, move quickly. So uh, we have to also prepare this uh, kind of shock in the future. That's all what I, I would like to say. Thank you very much. I think we had the, the great overview about the Japanese economy from rather micro side and the macro side. Uh, yeah, and the time is a little bit limited, but uh, we are happy to have uh, some questions and the comments. So that if you'd like to ask the presenters, please raise your hand. Okay, uh, could you start from there? What? You are the first and you are the second one. Uh, it would be great if you could tell your name and affiliation first. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. My name is James Prest. I'm with the ANU College of Law. Um, I have a question for uh, Kozu-san. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm interested, perhaps, at the possibilities of for the Japanese economy in a response to Ondanka, in the response to climate change. And if you could talk about that in terms of the uh, opportunities in the green uh, economy and the response to this challenge. Is, is it one by one? Or yeah, uh, is it a similar question? Different question. Quite, uh, your question is similar, different. Maybe that could you answer? Thank you very much. Um, this is the badge for SDGs, Sustainable, sustainable uh, Development Goals by the United Nations. And uh, many uh, Japanese big firm um, executives now wear this badge. I, I just wonder whether they truly know what this, uh, <laughs> uh, this, this, this goals uh, imply. But as you said, uh, 
this is a kind of a, from economics point of view, it is more like external effects part. And that kind of a, a, a higher average temperature on the globe or the, um, probably the fire in Amazon now is uh, partly because of the higher average uh, temperature because uh, there are some research results that if you have higher uh, research, uh, higher uh, uh, average temperature, then the, the area, you the forest area you lose by the fire, uh, it becomes larger. And these two things correlated uh, statically, statistically uh, supportive. I mean, so uh, current uh, uh, corporate management just doesn't include such external costs fully. Uh, the, the, uh, or more like plastic things, microplastic things in, in the sea that will broke the whole balance in, in the sea, uh, living creatures in the sea. That sort of cost will come up in, in, in coming uh, years and then farms should spend more on those areas. That means the calculations uh, made, for example, here today uh, is not fully covered all those extra costs uh, which uh, Japanese farms will face in coming uh, years. And so uh, with the even uh, lower uh, profitability, but that profitability will burden more uh, uh, constraints in the future. So that we, well, I'm always telling my colleagues in my firm, we have to brace for it. So. Um, I'm saying this towards the other uh, firms, uh, executives as well, but you're right. Uh, all those costs, possible potential costs, we, we can't include in our uh, simulations uh, we made now. Do you want to add something? Okay, no. Yeah, uh, I just want to add that, um, you know, Japan's um, overall, Japan is really an energy efficient country over the many, many years. And uh, uh, way back when I was in, uh, working for the Japanese government, the energy conservation efforts was full fledged. And, um, uh, but uh, that also means is that Japan's already did no, really to push to the envelope. So the, the margin for the more energy conservative, it's a very challenging to, to go even further. Okay, thank you very much. Is it okay? Yeah, so that. Uh, good morning, uh, Steve George, I'm a business owner. I'm just interested in um, your uh, observations about entrepreneurship in Japan. Um, what is uh, Japan's uh, policies in regards to stimulating business um, opportunities that would see importation of businesses uh, being created within Japan? And how, um, how does that relate to the, the, the trade policies that have been recently agreed upon? And how aggressive is uh, Japan taking its position in regards to stimulating business through those uh, particular policy me uh, mechanisms? Yeah, my understanding is that um, uh, you know, Japanese government uh, is aware that uh, entrepreneurship should be promoted and so the, um, you know, some kind of public money is, you know, is going into the um, supporting the entrepreneurial activities. Um, but um, it's, it's not just uh, you know government providing money. Um, I think it's both of the chicken and egg problem and the structure problem, and to really increase the uh, entrepreneurship, you know, the, the for education system needs to be changed so that uh, and uh, people, you know, the students are uh, exposed to the various career paths, various possibilities. Uh, right now. Um, as I showed in this, um, you know, recruiting effort, consulted effort uh, um, that follows a very strict calendar, um, you know, that kind of narrow the uh, mindset of the Japanese college students, and that might be also contributing to the uh, very uh, limited um, uh, career choice. 
And so the, uh, it's, it's about not just providing money. And uh, many things that's discussed is that, okay, uh, perhaps the exit strategy is limited in Japan, and, um, but I recently learned that to uh, take a company public, you know, a small company uh, uh, to take public, it's not that restrictive in Japan. There's a market like mothers, and uh, you can do it. The problem would be not just going, you know, to, uh, to the IPO, but another issue is that how much can you get the return? It's a you know, risk return ratio, and uh, that uh, return, expected return, even uh, in the, in, you know, in the Jap uh, Japanese entrepreneurship, that's much more limited than the US. That's my observation, that's my, what I'm hearing from the uh, Japanese entrepreneurs. Hey, Kusan, do you want to add something? Um, I just want Amongst participants here in this um, uh, room, including Ippei, who is teaching in universities in Japan, and uh, you may feel that it is not a matter of, of the framework laws or, or regulations to enhance the animal spirit of all those youngsters in Japan. Um, I, I believe it is so difficult for you lecturers to make them having uh, more animal spirits uh, but uh, it is all up to you to stimulate all those youngsters ha <laughs> having more encouraged to do ventures or to uh, go against the rigid elders like me and um, <laughs> um, 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 or all those young uh, researchers here who is going to uh, have some possibilities, to, uh, opportunities to teach in Japan. It is all up to you. I, I hope... Uh, Good luck in the future, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I need to teach the student like that man. But at the same time, there's a lots of system, as uh, Sakaki Barans mentioned, that there may be there's some lots of opportunities, funding, but uh, still the, you know, maybe the banks and the financial systems are not catching up with the, maybe the financing the ventures, you know, like uh, if you want to start the business, you know, personal guarantee is necessary. Then uh, if you fail your business, it's not the disaster for you, it's the disaster for whole family. So that, I think uh, you know we need to enhance the you know encourage the student to be very enthusiastic, but at the same time we need to look into the maybe the reform of the of course the labor market as well as the financial markets. Okay, yeah, right. And uh, so next question is I uh, yeah Bruce. Uh, Bruce Miller, uh, Sakaki Bara Sensei, I listened with great interest to your account of the rigidities on the <coughs> that apply still in the Japanese labor market. Uh, I, um, having served in government for 33 years, I'm now involved with uh, several Japanese companies and visit Japan regularly in that capacity. Uh, I, um, listening to what you had to say, uh, made me think about anecdotal evidence I've come across uh, in the Japanese labor market of how young people are now moving companies more than they used to move. That level of um, more people now particularly in their 20s and 30s, are shifting after five years from one company to another, uh, which I think is a breakdown to some extent in the rigidities that you were talking about. Absolutely. Uh, I've noticed it myself with um, Daichi Life is a company I'm particularly involved with in Japan at the moment. They're taking a lot of people laterally uh, from the side uh, in midlife in a way that never used to happen. And I think they're probably at the progressive end of uh, Japanese companies. But... I'm seeing that more and more, and I think that's quite an interesting phenomenon. I'd be interested in your comment on it. And secondly, I'd say I've also seen a greater degree of intra-company <coughs> career diversity, if you like. Companies, because of economic pressures, because of the demand for labour, are breaking down the rigid barriers between different streams within companies and bringing in people from uh, who are just doing straight administration work into more of a career stream or people in the sales force are now moving across into management positions and that's actually enhancing diversity targets as well. So this is anecdotal but I'd just be interested to see if, to know if you see a bigger pattern uh, of that sort of thing going on in the Japanese labour market. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, young people, um, you know, they don't really expect that uh, they're going to be in the same job. And uh, okay, with a sample of one, uh, my nephew, <laughs> uh, uh, he graduated from uh, Keio University and uh, he, work, uh, he joined one of the major consulting firm and I talked to him recently and uh, he didn't expect that he's going to be in the same consulting firm for a long period of time. And, uh, uh, so, you know, th that's really, um, I think uh, the mentality of uh, young people are changing, but uh, uh, what I see, is, uh, the problem is that even though uh, people are not really expecting to stay in the same job for a long period of time, the system of the, you know, the wage structure is such that, that, that rewards the people who would stay in the same company and, uh, you know, even if you move for the better opportunity, um, you, your wage doesn't go up, and so that, I think that is a problem. Uh, regarding the intra-company uh, career opportunities, I think it's still, it has been the norm. So the, the Japanese companies hire a bunch of uh, um, you know, new, new, new graduates from college and rotate people, let them experience various functions, and that system works under the assumption that the company would exist for the next 25 years or so. And, uh, but nowadays we can't really expect that. And so is the inter-company market more efficient than inter-company uh, in market? I think the latter is more, much more efficient. But again, the, uh, the, uh, the skill development uh, uh, to allow people to move outside of the company and to get a better wage, uh, I think the system is not there yet. Kosan, do you want to add something? No, I, I don't have much to add. But uh, in, in RICO, we are trying to establish a scheme that uh, trying to uh, to shorten the regular working hour and allowing our employees to use the extra hour to do second kind of a job lines. You, moonlighting? You got, it's kind of an offshore moonlighting. And so you, you could uh, just cross the boundary of the job lines you have and experience more larger uh, 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 fields and then that will help you be more innovative uh, or to, to, to lead you to reach good ideas in, in your major area. So this kind of uh, uh, trial is now happening in many uh, Japanese big firms to encourage our employees to be more innovative to conquer the difficulties now we face in Japan's economy. Okay, I think we have a lots of questions, but the time is limited, so I would like to have a, one last uh, question from Pete. And uh, they gonna, you know, we're gonna have a coffee break afterwards, and uh, you have a lots of chance to ask him, and uh, you will be here throughout the day, so that <laughs> you are not allowed to escape, so that he, they will be here, so you have a lots of chance to ask him a question. So Peter, could you, could you ask a and question? Peter Drysdale at the Crawford School here. Uh, you know, if you've been in US graduate school where they taught a course on the Japanese economy and Japanese business, 30 or 40 years ago before you were born, <laughs> uh, they would have told you that all these institutions that you want to change are the really powerful drivers of Japanese success and economic yeah, performance sure. and competitiveness. So the question really is, what, what is the fundamental circumstance in the Japanese economy that make you want to change all these institutions that have been so important to Japanese growth? And secondly, on the entrepreneurship thing, uh, by all indicators, Japanese entrepreneurship is very low. And yet, as Kozo's uh, indicators of Japanese productivity performance uh, show quite clearly, Japanese productivity performance has been really quite good. How is this so? How do you reconcile those two uh, inconsistent, apparently inconsistent facts? For Kozo, uh, if you, at the beginning of your presentation, you had mentioned uh, the US-China trade war uh, and how important that was going to be. I just want to draw you out a bit on that. I mean. That's clearly important, not only to the US and China, but it's fundamentally important to Japan because uh, China is a major element in Japan's economic competitiveness. The production chains connect very closely <coughs> with uh, Japan. Uh, we, we, uh, Japan's production chains connect very closely with China and Japan's competitiveness, industrial competitiveness, built on that. So what are the strategies that Japan needs to pursue in the face of the US-China-Japan? 
Yeah, final, but the big questions. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, I, yeah. yeah well, okay, right. uh, I, I don't think I'm capable of answering okay, answer those questions, but uh, let, let me take the easier one first. So that is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the relationship between productivity and entrepreneurship, and your point is that Japanese productivity is good, even though um, entrepreneurship is not fully developed. Okay, um, productivity, I, I studied the productivity um, you know, the productivity or innovation and the uh, uh, Greekers, uh, one of the uh, greatest um, uh, scholar in, in, in the field of uh, innovation. And uh, what I learned is that uh, it, for any economic change to show up in productivity, it takes long years, like Koza uh, mentioned. For example, the, um, the steam engine to the electricity, right? It didn't show, it happened in the UK and doesn't show up in the productivity because it, you know, to fully appreciate the using electricity in the factory, you, you don't, you have to change the full assembly line, the full design of the factory, design of the company, how they operate. Same thing as when a computer is introduced in the 70s. It doesn't show up in productivity statistics, not in the 80s, not in the 90s. Finally, in 2000, it showed up. The computer is really enhancing productivity. Why again, you know, it's, um, you know, to fully embrace the uh, computerization, you have to change the organization, how the information, information flows, how the information is stored, how the information is shared. So it takes a long time. So the, I think the, you know, the point of the internet showing up productivity, we, we are not, in terms of statistics, it's not there yet. We have to wait perhaps for the next 20 years to show up. I think the similar thing can be said uh, to entrepreneurship. Okay, and uh, what I, do I want to change in the Japanese system? I'm not too sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, such a fundamental problem. Perhaps in, the, in terms of entrepreneurship, you know, as uh, Fujiwara-san mentioned, um, you know, still the bank loan is um, one of the major sources to start a new business. And if you fail, that uh, your house would be gone, and your part your parents' house would be gone, right? So the uh, some kind of safety net um, um, or the more equity uh, provision would be good. Um, but uh, other than that, there's a f so, such a fundamental problem. Um, about the. Uh Authorities. I think uh, the Japanese authorities are trying to be less powerful in the area of in, in, in the existing area, established area. So we, I mean, they feel to uh, introduce more competition amongst the existing business area. But for the uh, new area, I think the new role for the authorities are, uh, is coming up because uh, all those uh, 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 um, kind of a network economy thing, it, it's more like in economics textbook, um, economies of scale uh, issues are coming up. And in those areas, I think, uh, the, uh, the market mechanism doesn't work in, in a strict sense, and therefore there are a, a room for maneuver for the authorities get into all those uh, networking or, 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 or a framework kind of things to, to enhance the productivity as a whole. So probably Japan's um, authorities will shift towards the new area where they will find new uh, role and then uh, get out from the existing area, leave it to the market. That kind of changes I'm expecting, and I, I think it is desirable. And about the um, uh, why so with so low enterprise ship but uh, uh, product, uh, productivity improving question, um, as far as the existing business fields are concerned, I think the uh, thanks to the te technological changes, I think uh, labor productivity has been improving. Uh, 
when you look at the, the production lines or the daily uh, businesses at the desks, uh, the, the productivity improved very much thanks to all those uh, internet. Um, for example, when, when you have to write a, a, an essay, in my days I just have to go to, I had to go to the library and checking out all the papers or books. But nowadays, all, all those students just looking through the uh, uh, Google and then you know, you know cut and paste and present uh, papers. That's, 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 that's not, not illegal. That's not, so good, yeah, that's <laughs> not on, allowed at UCLA. Yeah, on our side, <laughs> also we have a program to check uh, yes. the the you know uh, yeah, yes. the weight yeah. of yes. all those cut and pastes are less than a certain level of, of amount. So that's thanks to all those developments. Then I think the uh, productivity improved, but yet. It is a totally different thing to get into the totally new, unexperienced area to, to establish business, to, to make it uh, live longer and earn money. And as I said, if uh, it, uh, the internet kind of businesses or, or uh, uh, GAFA kind of businesses are kind of uh, winner takes all type of businesses, so the cost of entrant, entrant is quite higher than you know, inventing small uh, uh, products. And therefore, uh, I, I think Japan's uh, uh, lower animal spirit uh, hinders to, to get into the fully new uh, uh, area. So these two things coexist in Japan. I, that's, that's my understanding. Uh, on the third point, I haven't much talked to US people these days because they are very busy analyzing <laughs> their own president. Uh, so, uh, well, many say that it is better to, to, to follow the Twitter of uh, the president rather than analyzing the market or, the, you know, the economic data. Uh, and I think, uh, well, to, 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 to great, great uh, uh, extent, I agree with them. But I, the Chinese friends often uh, contact me to, to, uh, to, to study what uh, we did in, say, 80s against the U.S. They just want to know the detail, how we negotiate and how we fail. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they are studying thoroughly about all those ne negotiation process between Japan and the uh, US in 80s and try to get some good from, from our failure. Well, I don't know. They say our failure, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, who knows. But I'm telling all those Chinese friends that um, we are in the middle uh, geographically, Japan is in the middle of China and U.S., the two big economies on the globe. And Japan has, it, has its own history uh, occupied by the United States. And uh, so we just can't change that history, and we can't formally uh, or officially against the policy of the United States. But still, uh, our culture, our, uh, our characters, or uh, when you go to uh, Kyoto or Nara, uh, uh, they say, I mean, the Chinese say, they could enjoy the taste of their own cultures through the temples, shrines, mm -hmm. which we imported, say, a thousand years ago. So uh, having said that, we are in the middle of two countries, so there are distinctions between what we can and what, what we can't. But still, it means, again, f uh, economics text uh, context. There is some kind of a equilibrium between these two things. Trying to find that delicate balance is the way Japan will behave. So in most cases, my Chinese friends understand what I'm saying. Uh, but uh, when you go to the capital, uh, Beijing, uh, officially, they don't agree with me. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's what I can say to your yeah. question. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, there was, there was a, maybe add something. Yeah, yeah uh, just to add uh, to that point about the Japan's experience in the 80s uh, uh, to deal with the trade fr friction uh, against the US. Um, I was a government official in the 80s in Japan, and my impression is that Japan just uh, gave up and uh, followed <laughs> whatever the US said. So I, I don't think that's a good model. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. It's an impressive ending of the session. <laughs> but, okay, uh, thank you very much for participating in the economy panel and uh, for the active discussion. And uh, please join me uh, thanking for two fantastic speakers. Thank you very much.